All right. So I got this call from Pastor John. And uh, my phone rings, and, you know, of course, I've got him, you know, in my phone because he's my pastor, right? And I pick up the phone, and he goes, hey, bad. <laughs> I'm like, what is happening right now? You know, like, like, is this a prank phone call or what? I'm like, hello? He's like, hey, Ben, this is John. And I'm like, Juan? Like, who is this person, you know? <laughs> no, this is Pastor John. I barely have a voice. And he's explaining this whole thing to me and how he can't speak this Sunday. Disappointed, but can't make it. And he asked me if I would speak. And I said, sure, I'll speak. He's like, this Sunday. And I said, <clears throat> Uh, I think I got something I'm coming down with if it's this Sunday. No, I just said, sure, I'll do it. Whatever it takes for Calvary Chapel, right? Come on. Yeah. So for you guys that I haven't met before, my name is Ben Phillips. I'm the high school youth pastor. And uh, I would have been with the high school youth today, but we brought them in with us so we could all be together since Pastor John couldn't be here. You know, we can still have church, right? All right. Hello, Pastor John, if you're watching at home. So I want to talk to you guys today about God's amazing grace. Now, I hope for you guys that have been in the church for a while and have been walking with Jesus for a while, I didn't just lose you, okay? Because when we say these common phrases, we say things that we've heard before, we use these phrases a lot, it can sound a little cliche, like we've talked about it before. We talk about it a lot. We have a lot of songs that talk about God's amazing grace. I hope that I didn't just lose you because God's grace truly is amazing. G.K. Chesterton, he said this, familiarity breeds inattention. And sometimes we can talk about stuff so much and we can hear about it so much and sing these songs and where this familiarity, it just breeds inattention. We just don't pay attention to it the way that we should. You know, we talk about things that are awesome. And we're referring to little kittens on YouTube, you know. Or, or we talk about things that are, that are so awesome. This burrito, you know, that I'm eating is so awesome. We talk about stuff and how amazing things are. Look at this couch I picked up. It's amazing, you know. I mean, people talk like this and they express things like this with things that they just truly aren't amazing. They truly aren't awesome. But these are the words that we use. But you guys, some things, they truly are amazing. They truly do inspire awe within us. And one of those things that does that for me, and I hope that as we're looking at this today, it does it for you, is God's grace. It truly is an amazing thing that humbles me, it brings me to tears, and I've been walking with Jesus for a long time. It blows my mind, the amazing grace that God has for us. The, the grace that was there when we got saved, you know, like Ephesians 2 talks about, for by grace are you saved, but also the grace that keeps us and sustains us. For those of you guys that have been believers for a, a long time, still even to this day, you say right along with the Apostle Paul, he says, by the grace of God, I am what I am. God's grace is awesome, and it's amazing. It is the most wild, amazing, outlandish, wonderful, awe-inspiring thing when we really stop to think about what it is and what God does for us. Think about all the songs that have been sung about this. We've got the classic, right? John Newton. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound. I mean, that has resonated with people throughout the generations, right? This amazing grace that God has. We got one, Phil Wickham, more recently. This is amazing grace. People are still singing about it. We got another one that I love, Hillsong, Broken Vessels. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I mean, people have been singing about this for years, generations, for decades, because it is amazing. It's something to sing about, not just talk about. I mean, we can talk about this stuff. 
but it's something that stirs the soul, that when you really think about it, it gets you excited. I mean, there's something that wells up inside when you realize what God has done for you, what he's done for you, and what he continues to do for you, the way that he loves you, his mercies that are new every morning, his amazing, awesome grace towards you, man, it stirs the soul. It's something that ought to be sung about and has been sung about a lot. I love it. Think about some of these people that write these songs. You know, John Newton. We know that he was a slave trader. He used people. It was his business. He wrecked people's lives. He considered them tools, instruments for other people's gain. It was awful what he did to people as a slave trader. And yet that's why he knew God's grace was so amazing towards him. That's why he would say something like, that has saved a wretch like me. God's amazing grace. Think about Paul, the apostle Paul. You can read about this in Philippians chapter 2 where he talks about that he was Pharisee of Pharisees, a Hebrew, a Benjaminite, all these things that he talked about, right? Of a persecutor, which basically means that he went and he killed Christians. I mean, he went out and he, he killed people in the name of God. And yet, he met the Lord and he met God in this amazing grace towards him. Do you remember what Jesus said to him? Saul, Saul, why are you persecuting me? Not, why are you killing my people? Why are you persecuting me? And yet from that God, his heart says, I have all the grace in the universe for you. A guy that kills Christians. Think about another guy, Matthew, the tax collector. Nobody liked that guy. <laughs> right? I mean, here's a guy that was a Jew, but he was working for the enemy. Right? He's working for the Romans. He's collecting taxes. These people are like, we don't want the Romans. We don't want them here in Jerusalem. We, we don't want anything to do with them. And yet, here's this guy that's riding the fence, both a Jew and collecting taxes on the wrong side. And yet, he found this amazing grace that God ha had for him. Amazing. I don't know about uh, how many of you guys have read the book, What's So Amazing About Grace, that was written by Philip Yancey. I read that, I don't know, 20 plus years ago. Great book. Um, when I was thinking about this message, I want to read that book again because it, it's a good read. I, I recommend it. Um, but that's basically what we're exploring today. What is so amazing about God's grace? Why are people singing about it? Why do people talk about it so much? For some of you guys here today, it's like, I don't know. I don't know why it's amazing. I hear people talking about it and see people get all pumped up writing songs and, you know, all these things. Or maybe you're here today and you're like, yeah, it's become kind of commonplace. The familiarity has bred inattention towards that. I don't know where you're at today, but that's what I want to explore with you guys in these next few minutes that we have together. What is so amazing about God's grace? I want to show you guys a picture. Um, some of you guys might recognize this if you happen to live uh, in the south of Olympia. Uh, this is a billboard. It used to be right on the side of I-5. How many of you guys remember seeing this? Some of you guys, Rochester folk, you know, driving down to Nina, <laughs> Centralia. All right, you probably saw this. But here's this billboard on the side of the road, and, and whenever I see this, I, I, I always think, why is that woman so excited? You know, why is she so, like, pumped up? You know, I mean, she's probably just some type of model that they pick for casinos. I don't know if they have such a thing. You know, like, yeah, we need a model casino for... I don't know, something like that. Anyways, I see this billboard, and this lady's all excited, right? I mean, she's pumping her fist. You know, she's, ah, she's so, you know, pumped up about this thing. And basically what I think about is that this woman's excited, right? And, like, just thrilled and, and emotional about this because apparently she walked into the Lucky Eagle Casino, and she won a fat stack of cash that she didn't earn, right? Like, she didn't, she didn't work for it. She didn't deserve it. She didn't earn it. But she showed up and she walked away with a fat stack and that's what the people that made this billboard want you to think. You could do the same. Um, and if you think that, we could have a little financial counseling afterwards, you know, to kind of like help set you guys straight on that whole thing. Um, 
But what I think about when I see this is, this woman is thrilled. She's excited. She's exploding with excitement. She's overwhelmed with emotion because she got something that she didn't earn. How many of us, when we think about God's grace, feel that way? I can't believe this. I mean, I can't believe that his mercies are new every morning. Are you kidding me for me? God, do you know me? Well, yeah, you, you know everything about me. You know my thoughts from afar. I mean, Psalms 139, I can go anywhere. And you know me. You know my thoughts. You know my motives. You know all these things. And your mercies are still new every morning? You still have this grace for me? She's blown away. And I'm just wondering, are we blown away? I mean, do we, do we realize that? Like, we, we haven't earned any of this stuff. Got a question for you. Let's say you get a job, right? And the agreement is you're going to get 20 bucks an hour for doing this particular job. And you show up, and you do your job, and you get paid 20 bucks an hour. Are you, like, thrilled? I mean, are you, are you like wow, I can't believe that, you know, I showed up and I put in my eight-hour shift and I actually got 20 bucks an hour for doing this. No, you're like, well, that's my wage. That was the agreement that we had, right? That I would do the work and I would get paid 20 bucks an hour. Just kind of what you have coming, right? You you earned it. Uh, Let me ask another question. Uh, How do you feel when you break traffic laws and then you get a ticket? I mean, you know, like... I've been pulled over, I've got tickets, you know, I confess this before the whole church, you know, this has happened. Um, I mean, it got so bad that there, there's a couple guys in our church that are in the state patrol. You guys might know Dino Garcia, some of you guys know him, um, or Brian Chase, you know, uh, Brian Chase also works for, uh, for state patrol. And I got the privilege a few years back of officiating at uh, Brian and Gabby's wedding, and uh, of course, you know, we did premarital counseling. They got their vows together and all this kind of stuff. And I had their prepared vows that I was going to read to them like a good pastor. But I worked in my own vow that I had that was special for Brian to vow to me. And, and they didn't expect this. They didn't even know about it. But I just whipped it out in the, in the service. And I said, okay, Brian, repeat after me. I, Brian Chase of the State Patrol, I, Brian Chase, State Patrol, will never give Ben Phillips a citation. <laughs> and he's like, you know, in front of everybody, you know, giving this vow, and he did it. I mean, I'm really excited about that. I feel great that he actually went through with it. Um, and I don't know how this has played out. You know, like on I-5, he's with a radar gun, and he's like, oh, who's this fool going 70? Oh, man, it's Ben Phillips. I can't do anything about it, you know? <laughs> like, <laughs> I gave a vow. I, I don't know how this has played out for him, but... Um, you know, if I got pulled over, re- really, like by Dino or Brian, and, and I was speeding and they gave me a ticket, I'd be like, yeah, okay, give me the ticket. You know, I, I was speeding, you know, like I, I deserve that. But you know that feeling when, when, when you know you're busted, right? You got the busted out taillight, you were speeding, you know, you were just doing everything wrong, right? You get pulled over and they said, hey, I'm going to let you go on a warning today. It's like, all right, that's, that's grace, that's mercy right there, you know? Imagine if you had that job, 20 bucks an hour, you put in your work, you know, and you're expecting just 20 bucks an hour, and they say, okay, well, you put in your work, but we are actually going to be paying you $200 per hour. And on top of that, there's a benefits package that goes with it, and life insurance. And we actually know that you showed up late five times this last month, and you've been doing half-hearted work. And you've been trashing the boss. But we're going to give you $200 an hour. We're going to give you a benefits package. We're going to give you life insurance. People, this is what Jesus has done for us. I mean, it's put this way in in Ephesians. I love this. That he has given us every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places. He's given us every blessing. But we're the guys that show up late and do half-hearted work and aren't grateful and doubt our boss and all these things. 
And yet his heart of grace and love towards us is so amazing. It's powerful because it can't be earned. And this is how Christianity is distinct from every other religion in the world. It's this right here. It's God's grace towards us. Not that we have to earn anything. We're not saved by our works. We are saved by grace. Praise God for that. Because we'd be hopeless without that. And he doesn't just say that you're forgiven. That would be enough, right? You're off the hook. That would be enough. But he doesn't just say that. He says, you're forgiven, and I'm also going to make you my own. I'm going to make you my child. I'm going to adopt you. My heir. You're going to be grafted in. Basically, he's saying... I'm not going to judge you for your sin. I'm going to forgive you of that. But I'm also going to redeem you. I'm also going to bless you with every spiritual blessing. I'm also going to love you forever. You're now in my family, in my kingdom. Wow. One of the most amazing and profound illustrations of God's grace is found in the book of Hosea, where you see God telling Hosea to go and be faithful to his unfaithful wife. I want you to go and be committed to a woman of prostitution. And I want you to go find her, and I want you to commit yourself to her, but not just that. I want you to buy her back out of slavery and love her. I mean, do you see what I'm talking about now when I I use words like amazing? When I use words like wild, outlandish, unheard of, awe-inspiring, humbling, life-changing, it's stuff like this. And we got a video that um, we want to show today of... uh, of a guy that I think tells the story well and just really captures what's happening in the story of Hosea and and Gomer. And so, enjoy this video. Hosea chapter 3, verse 1, Then the Lord said to me, Go again, Hosea. What? Go find her. Love this woman who's loved by a lover and is right now committing adultery. Go find her, Jose. Go find her. Look what's after the comma. Just like the love of the Lord for Israel. I love her. Now where it says Israel, it means Israel, but it also prophetically speaks of God's love for the whole world. Go find her again. This, this is like my love for the children of Israel who look to other gods and love the raisin cakes of the pagans. In other words, they like the things that society, stuff, possessions that the world offers. They're trying to find love and meaning and purpose in that. Go, go, go find her. Boy, that must have been a heart-wrenching process. As you go looking for your wife who was a former prostitute, who's now back into prostitution. Where do you go looking for her, friends? How messy is that search? How painful is that pursuit? As he walks the streets, streets, everyone says you don't go to those neighborhoods. Men of God should never be seen in those places and buildings. But here's Hosea. Looking for who? His wife of all people. Going on in verse 2, he continues to write, So I bought her. I bought her for myself for 15 shekels of silver and one and one half homers of barley. Wait, 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 wait. She's your wife, Hosea. She's already yours. 
What was the scene like? As Gomer's back in the sex slave industry. What are the chances? Does Gomer find her on some pedestal somewhere, chained and shackled, naked, being sold to the highest bidder? Hosea there sees his wife, the mother of their three children, and Hosea looks at her and says, excuse me, sir, that's my wife. He goes, sir, I don't care who you think she is. This is her price. But I, hey, what's the price? And he pays for what is already his. The Bible says, I hope you understand, Hosea is a picture of God, and no offense, you and I are a picture of Gomer. The Bible says the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Mankind is the unique possession of the Creator God. And yet, 2,000 years ago, he paid a dear price. He paid for what he already possessed. And he sent his son who spilled his blood to purchase back what he already owned. How much? Hosea gets the money. What was that exchange like when Hosea looked in the eyes of his wife? No doubt she hung her head in embarrassment. He's found me. I've abandoned him. I've abandoned our three kids. And yet he insists on buying me. Buying me. As these other men sought to buy her, to use her. Hosea seeks to buy her, to heal her. It says in verse 4, for the children of Israel shall abide. Now, now this is where Hosea shifts in and he starts speaking prophetically. This is, this is really no longer about him and Gomer. It's about something that is to come. It's about something bigger. Verse 5. Afterward, afterward, there's going to come a season. He didn't know it would be 750 years, but it would. There would be no king. It would be difficult. It would be unclear. It would be challenging. But then the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God and David their king. And then notice what it says. They shall fear the Lord. Now, Israel and Judah knew how, what it was to fear the Lord. And by fear, I mean terror. Under the old system of relating to God, there was terror, terror, because God, they were unable to keep his commands, the Ten Commandments, and there was judgment and there was wrath. But there will come a day, he prophesies, there will come a Messiah, and he will finally satisfy and appease the wrath of God. And the fear of the Lord in those days will be in awe of his goodness in the latter days. The fear of the people will not be of terror. It will be the in awe of his graciousness towards humanity. Hosea just bought Gomer even though she was already his. This is the picture of the gospel. Salvation completes the work in spite of her sins, in spite of her doings, in spite of running away. And then he stands and says, and there will come a day a King David will rise. And in those days they will fear his goodness. These are the days that we live in. Our Hosea has come. Salvation has come. And he found you. And he found me. And he had to walk to the most despicable places. And he had to uh, uh, communicate and, and be around sinful, broken humanity. Don't you see? As Hosea searched for his wife, so Jesus came searching for the salvation of humanity. And by the way, when God found you, you were not so neat and nice and put together. You were in chains and you were naked and you were sinful and so was I. And our gracious God said, how much? How much? The blood of your son, for then and only then, can they, humanity, advert the wrath and justice 
that is rightfully on their heads. Very well. Very well. I'll send my son. It's amazing, isn't it? And that's just one of the stories in the Bible where it talks about this. There's so many. There's so many. God is trying to say from so many different angles how much he loves us. And that his graciousness is based upon his own character, not our own loveliness or worthiness but his worth, his goodness, his graciousness, his faithfulness. You know, it's easy to hear a story like that one and see how amazing God's grace is, but I wonder if it might get lost on some of you guys where you're like, that's not my story. I don't have Gomer's story. You know, we're the Christian family. We do Christian homeschooling. We have a Christian minivan. When we select breath mints at the store, we select the Christian breath mints. I mean, all these things, right? How, what does that look like for me? What is God's grace for me? It's interesting, you know, you look at Paul and the progression that he went through in his life. He realized at a point that I'm killing Christians. I'm definitely on the wrong team here. I need God's grace in my life to be changed. And he started to change. There were some times God started doing some work in his life, but he speaks about this different places in the scriptures where, where there was some spiritual pride that had started to puff him up. And it's so easy for that to happen. You know, when we have done everything right and we're following all God's commands, we can start to forget that it is by his grace. We can forget that I'm only here by the grace of God. And my life being blessed with all of these Christian things, it's by the grace of God. How easy even spiritual pride can sneak in and we can start thinking that we're doing it on our own rather than something that the Lord has done um, in each of us by his grace. Guys, remember when Jesus met with Nicodemus? Remember who Nicodemus was in John chapter 3? He was a Pharisee. He's a guy that memorized way more scripture than I have. He was a guy that had devoted his life to the service of God. And yet, what did Jesus even say to that man that to many people was the model follower of God at that time? He told him, you must be born again. There's radical change that needs to happen in your life. And it happens by the love of God, by the grace of God. It's easy to forget those things. Or Isaiah, when he said, before the Lord, I am a man of unclean lips. Think of Paul when he said at the end of his life in 2 Timothy, when he was talking about himself, he said, I'm the chief of sinners. We're talking after he had written all these letters to the church and all these things. I'm the chief of sinners. It's like the closer he got to God, the, the more clearly he could see God's holiness and goodness and grace and how deficient he was and how much further he had to go. When we think about the gospel, don't think of it like you lock it in this time of Ephesians 2 where it says, for by grace are you saved. That's great, but don't keep it there. Remember that when Paul wrote all these letters to the churches, he was writing the letters to churches. The church in Rome, the church in Corinth, the church in Galatia, Thessalonica, Ephesus, these places. He's talking to believers and talking about how important and significant and foundational and life-giving the gospel is. How amazing God's grace is for believers. It's the wind in our sails. It's what we need every day. It's not just how we got into the kingdom. The gospel is for us. It's for believers. This amazing grace. How's it going to change us? Let it change you. You guys, I prepare a message like this, and I just see so many ways that there is change that's needed in my life. I mean, God, I just cry out to God. It's like, God, I just got to look at everything differently, and I don't. 
I mean, my whole economy has got to change when I see your grace. The way that I treat people, it's got to change because I've experienced the grace of God. I've experienced this amazing grace. You guys, let this stuff be way more than just theory and principle. Okay, like we can sit here today and a lot of heads nodding. You guys are like, yeah, we're the church. Yeah, I believe in God's grace. It's amazing, all this kind of stuff. And, it, and it's all in theory and it's all in principle. Let it be way more than that. Let it be your hope. Let it be, let it be what you're living for, what you need. Not just this is my doctrine, but this is the doctrine that has deeply impacted the deep recesses of my life. Those cold, dark, hard places. Those places where I'm judgmental towards other people. I don't want to serve them. I don't want to be gracious. I don't want to give them things that they don't deserve. I don't want to do these things. Oh, let the grace of God wash over you into those deep places of your life. Let it radically change you. Paul says in 1 Timothy, the goal of our instruction is love from a pure heart. So I hope that that's one of the outcomes of our time here together today is that, that this instruction, this doctrine, this teaching, these principles that we're talking about today, it would affect you deeply and it would result in love that issues from a pure heart. It would result in love for God. Let it sink deep. Let it change my thinking, my values. So back to the casino lady. Have we let this affect us? Have we let this affect our emotions? Have we let this affect our thinking? I read a book a few years back by Martin Lloyd-Jones called Spiritual Depression. It basically, sorry, I'm going to give it away, okay, if you haven't read this book, but it's a great book. Basically, he says, when we get spiritually depressed, we've just forgot all this stuff that I'm talking about. Somehow it hasn't been in the forefront of our mind. We aren't reminding ourselves of this stuff. We just, we aren't putting our faith in God. We aren't reveling in and rejoicing in the gospel. We just kind of let it slip our mind or become this thing that we're not in awe of. We just got back from winter camp this last weekend. And as we were driving back from White Pass, just a beautiful view. It was a sunny day, snow everywhere. If you guys have driven that route, you know it's amazing. Come around this one spot. I'm driving the, the school bus, you know, bringing everybody back. And I knew we were coming to this amazing view of Mount Rainier where it just pops out. It's like, wow. Look, it's, I mean, aren't we blessed to live in this place, you guys? Come around the corner, and I say to everybody in the bus, hey, guys, look to the left. There's an amazing view of Mount Rainier. And it was like this. <laughs> I mean, you know, we all do the same thing, right? Like we're driving down I-5 in a squally, you know, it's like, oh, yeah, there it is. I'm back to texting while I'm driving, you know, <laughs> or whatever it is. You know, we, we just, you guys, let's take this in. You know, like, let's not fall into that thing that G.K. Chesterton talks about, the familiarity breeding in attention. Man, when we rise in the morning, thank you, God, for your grace and mercy in my life. Thank you that you love me. Thank you that I'm your child. Thank you that there's nothing that can separate me from you today, that can separate us in this loving relationship. So I don't know where you're at today, but I just hope that there's this renewed sense of appreciation for God's grace. For you guys, for the first time, you're like, wow, i got to get some of that if I don't have it. i got to experience this. And let it affect the way that you go to work tomorrow. You know, let it affect the way that you treat your family and all these things. That's my prayer. That's my need is to be changed in these ways. And it happens by God's grace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's all stand and... Uh, I'll pray as the worship team comes back out. Lord, thank you for your grace towards each one of us. Thank you, Lord, that you look at us and you, you see us for what we are. You know us. And we're loved. And your grace 
Lord, is abundant towards each one of us today. We praise you for that, Lord. Praise you, God, for this amazing, wild, outlandish, wonderful grace that is real for each one of us. Thank you that that's how we're saved, and thank you that, Lord, that's how we thrive and are sustained in our life is by your grace. Help us to know it. Help us to be people that extend that to the people around us so that more can know it. God, you're good, and we want your goodness to be known. I just pray for wherever people are at this morning, Lord, that they would know that they can come to you and they will find this grace. It doesn't matter what we've done. It doesn't matter what our history is, our track record, our mess we've made of our lives. We can come and find grace in your presence. And Lord, we praise you. And we bless the name of Jesus. And everyone said, amen. Amen.